Hey folks, Ken Ackathorn here. Another segment of Gun Guys, but the special treat for you today, if I got an old buddy of mine, an old G guy, <laughs> Ernest Langdon. We've known each other for over 20 years. And we're gonna talk today about Berettas, Beretta 92s. Ernest is a subject matter expert on it. Um, I've been around him for a while. I guess one of the questions a lot of people would, would ask, you were in the Marine Corps at the time the transition was made from the 1911 pistol to the M9 Beretta. How did that experience go for you? You know, it, it was an easy experience. Um, a very, very tail end, 1911s. I mean, they were they were being phased out, but we we had them for quite a few years uh, in, in different capacities. Uh, the, the biggest thing I remember was, uh, the, the important thing to note, the military does not do a good job of teaching guys to shoot handguns, yes. contrary to properly, unless you're in a, a specialty unit, a special operations unit, or uh, some sort of you know special training unit, you're not gonna get the level of training that you probably should with a handgun. So the transition for me was not difficult because I didn't have a lot of training with either platform early on. You know, the, mm -hmm. my big remembrance of the 1911 is probably similar to what guys remember, most guys getting out of the military now remember of the M9. Mm -hmm. and they were falling apart. Yep, I and mean, they would literally disassemble while you shot, fall apart, you know, yeah, parts going down out. range, worn out. So you know, it's not fair to the 1911, uh, my experiences with it in the military, um, but the transition was not difficult for me at all. You know, it was kind of interesting because I'm an old 1911 guy, I'm of that era. And I can remember when the military in 1985 basically conducted the trials and they basically selected the Beretta. And being an old 1911 guy, I was somewhat incensed like everybody that this upstart is going to take the place of the great 1911 pistol. And I honestly had somewhat of a negative attitude towards it. But I remember that I thought, look, I'm training U.S. military people. I'm going to have to learn to use this pistol. And I got hold of Warren Barron, who was my point of contact for Breda oh, yeah. back in yeah, that yeah. day, and said, hey, I need one of these Breda 92s. Demand form was very high then. Uh, of course, most of the production was going to the U.S. military, so the, the private sector market, they were pretty difficult guns to get. But he sent me one. And I got it, and I thought, well, I'm going to learn how to run it. And what I discovered even though I had somewhat of a prejudice against it, man, it's a good pistol. It's soft shooting, incredibly reliable, very accurate. Compared to 1911s, actually, it's a pretty easy gun to shoot. Now, I can remember, and you remember the day, too, where Colonel Jeff Cooper, one of his comments was the trouble with double-action pistols is they're, in essence, a solution to a non-existent problem. Well, Jeff was very prejudiced against the double-action triggers, partly because in that era, most guy that, Guys, remember, or, or knowledge was a P-38 Walther, which had a very heavy double action trigger. But I had grown up with revolvers. I was an old Smith & Wesson DA revolver shooter. Sure. What I discovered, learning to shoot the DA trigger on a Breda M92 or M9 wasn't a big deal. No. And I think one of the things you've had to overcome over the years is kind of to convince people that don't tell yourself it's hard. Just practice with it and you pick it up pretty quick. Right. It's, it's actually not very difficult at all. And, and the interesting thing is you, you bring up a, a kind of a good point in that you grew up as a revolver guy. Uh, so did Bill. Obviously, Bill, yeah. you know, can be pretty, both of you can shoot anything, I, I think it's fair to say. But uh, most of the guys that in the law enforcement era that transitioned to the Beretta grew up as revolver guys, too. Yeah. I mean, the predominant uh, handgun in law enforcement uh, well into the early 90s, really, was, was still the, a revolver. Yeah, basically a Smith & Wesson Model 10 was the dominant gun. Right. Yeah. So for them, transitioning to a traditional double-action gun was not difficult either because they already knew how to pull that double-action yeah. trigger. And, you know, uh, we can <clears throat> remember that when the U.S. military adopted the M9 pistol in basically 1986, it was the hot gun. Everybody wanted one. Right. And police agencies all over America rushed out and adopted this mm -hmm. pistol. Um, and in the civilian sector, everybody wanted them. And mm -hmm. they were real pot for a while, and then actually they kind of lost a little momentum. And the way we met was actually at the beginning of the creation of IDPA. Bill Wilson and, and some of us put it together. We met you, you were living in Virginia, Fairfax area at the time. Right. You were an up and coming hotshot shooter. We hit it off, we kind of traveled the same match circuits, became pretty good friends. Mm -hmm. and. 
share a few hotel rooms at times. Yeah, we did. When budgets budgets were tight. Yeah, we didn't have a lot of money, you know. (laughs) I always tell the story about Ernie at Langdon at that time, you were driving on some kind of a little three-cylinder car. Oh, yeah, with a tiny little, we would call him the pizza delivery man. Yeah, with PDV. (laughs) The PDV. Ernie's the pizza (laughs) delivery man there. Kicker is... That one of the, you were working for Beretta at the time. That's was. And you were what? Their mil- government? Law enforcement operations manager was okay. my title probably at that point. Oh. Yeah. And to your credit, and if most people don't realize, Bill Wilson has been a big Beretta 92 guy for a long time. Mm-hmm. When IDPA started, if you ever look at the symbol for IDPA, the, the gun, it mm-hmm. looks a lot like a Beretta 92. <laughs> yes, it does, yeah. Because we didn't want it to look like a 1911 because we said, well, that's Bill Wilson trying to sell pistols in IDPA. So we purposely changed the shape or image to basically Beretta. And Bill shot at Beretta at the oh, very first IDPA one. Nationals. Very well. And so did I, by the way. Yeah. And But the kicker was you saw kind of the handwriting on the wall and you were behind the development of a pistol that was called the 92 Elite. Mm-hmm. Matter of fact, not only did I buy one, you tuned the trigger on it. Yep. Still shoot that gun to this day. It's a great old gun. And that really kind of lit the fire. I remember in the, suddenly Bretta's became cool again. And I know Bretta sold not only a lot of the, the Elites, but they actually had an Elite 2 series, That's I believe. Right. The Elite 2 was also but my gun. it wasn't long after that you moved on to another company, gun yeah. culture related gun company. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's kind of interesting mm. that you've always been, you know, it's funny, you worked for a number of other gun companies, mm. but you kind of came back to your roots, the Beretta. I did. Yeah, I did. And Bill Wilson here a few years ago, you know, he made an agreement with Beretta and brought out his first full-size Beretta. And it's recently this uh, Brigadier uh, Centurion yeah. type is, is his. But about it, he kind of relit the fuse again. Oh, yeah. And suddenly people was like, this is actually a cool gun. And I think it's interesting that now that you're a consultant for Beretta, mm-hmm. you got your own training business, mm-hmm. own accessory business, mm-hmm. more, mainly geared towards the Beretta products. Correct. And just recently you've introduced a new pistol, which in many ways is somewhat reminiscent of the original Elite you came out with over 20 years ago. Correct. Tell us a little bit about your new gun. So uh, this is the Elite LTT. Um, so this is a four year long project with Beretta, as we know Beretta. Uh, they eventually listen, but sometimes it takes some time, but they've done a great job here. This particular one's my personal gun, so it's got a few MP3 parts on it and stuff, but it is very much an M9A1 frame, but it has the Vertex slide on it. You remember the Vertex as well. Yeah. Uh, and the big thing the Vertex slide gives us is that dovetail, dovetail front, front sight, sight. Yeah. because without that dovetail front sight, as you know, the original Brett has had a fixed front sight, you don't have a lot of options when it comes to what you can do there. So that, that is the big thing. Front cock inserations, which there's only the only there's only a handful of Berettas ever produced with front cock inserations right. on them. And we, the other bit cool thing we did was we've ra- radius this corner, this bottom corner on underneath of the trigger guard that's exclusive to this factory produced Beretta. And as you know, that that's a first. knuckle. That's yeah. why all of us that are shooters have that <laughs> callus right there on our Absolutely, yeah. we do. I call it the Glock callus. Yeah, way, right. Glocks will do it too, but it's really the Beretta one will cut yeah, you sometimes. This, this sharp edge there can mm-hmm. kind of wear on you. Oh, yeah, it's pretty yeah. bad. Uh, we also, uh, for guys with big hands, we also cut the corner on the back of the slide too. Kind of so now back. we don't have that sharp edge. Sharp edge. If you got really big hands, you get really high on the gun, that thing will come back and get you too. Yeah. So, uh, you know, a lot of features very similar to uh, both the Brigadier Tactical and the Elite, original Elite, but we added a few more things into it, so. I, I think it's interesting for the folks to note that when Bill got ready to set up the uh, Wilson Combat Beretta line, he brought you in as a consultant. And I think you showed the guys a lot about, for example, tuning the guns, doing trigger work. So a lot of the input and a lot of the stuff that exists now in the Wilson Combat line of Brettas, really you had some influence on. I did, yeah. We, we, we consulted on, of course, they made them think the things come to fruition. I had a lot of ideas and, you know, the, the MAG guide, for example, you know, my idea and was, you know, they made it happen really quick. The trigger bar, which, by the way, the Wilson uh, trigger bars are just tremendous dynamite piece of kit. Dynamite yeah. piece of kit. I mean, it, if there's a we can get lane, a trigger that's unreal. Yeah, uh, very, very nice. Yeah. So that was uh, one of the things. Like, here's something you can do that really needs yeah. addressing, and they've done a tremendous job with that. So, yeah, we've uh, Bill and I have, uh, and the Wilson crew have 
consulted on quite a few things and we've made some cool stuff happen for the 92. Cool. I mean, we owe a lot of credit, well, most of the credit to Bill for bringing the 92 yeah. back to making it yeah. what it is. Today. Yeah, he kind of brought it back. And it's interesting, you know, um, everybody, and this is my, fa I've got one of each of the of the Wilson brothers. Matter of fact, Bill convinced me that, you know, I had my, I was born in 46, so I've got to have 46 of my, my serial number is 46 of mine, but, the Centurion's my favorite. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, every time I drag it out to the range and let my buddy, everybody that shoots the first time is like, wow. Right. I mean, it's not what they expect. It no. is, I mean, the triggers are superb. I said, if you're going to buy one, pay the extra for the Wilson Combat Trigger Tune. It is worth it. And I know one of your big uh, steps now is you've kind of put together what you call it, like a trigger in a bag. Trigger in a bag. Yeah. Trigger in a bag. Basically, you've got all the components, trigger. everything properly adjusted. Mm -hmm that if the guy has any skills at all, he can put those parts in his bread and produce a really dynamite trigger job. Yeah. I've heard a lot and of people bragging about that. Very, very successful. Now it has the will, the, the, at the heart of it is the Wilson trigger bar. Yeah. Um, but with hammer sear, hammer strut, um, all, the, all the springs that you need, all uh, tuned and ready to go. And uh, you just basically take your old parts out, put these parts in and you end up with a Really nice trigger for, for you know, I mean, it's 90%, if not just as good as a full house trigger job. You know, you just don't have the ability to go, yeah, we could tweak this and pull it back out and fix it. One of the things I think <clears throat> is kind of interesting that in many ways, you're the guy, and when you were early at Breda, that said, I want to take a service pistol and basically refine it. And mm -hmm. was the, it was the Elite Series, mm -hmm. which really cool gun. Um, you left Breda, went, worked for some other companies. You know, the cycle kind of changed. Striker pistols became all the rage. Double action pistols kind of fell out of favor. Bill, who's always been a Breda fan, decided some years ago to launch his custom line in agreement with Breda, and his pistols have been tremendous uh, resurgence. And here you are, you've kind of come around in a circle, and now you're back on board with Breda, and you've brought out, in essence, your pistol, which there are... A lot of similarities, and there are a few differences. Correct. But in essence, both pistols have kind of taken an, a design that's, what, 35 years, 30 or 5 years old, and have refined it. And in many ways, it's kind of like, you know, the 1911 has been re, had a rebirth many times mm -hmm. in refinement. And to a large degree, and interestingly enough, the bread is like, like an old service pistol, is kind of going through the same reno renovation. Right. Yeah, right that's now. very very similar to what we saw in the 1911 over the years. I mean, a lot of that, and the pieces and the parts, different companies making different pieces and parts yeah. for the company. Yeah, absolutely. And listen, folks, I think one of the th key things to remember, not only are, are Bill Wilson and, and Ernest Langdon really creative in how the design has been improved, they have both one thing in common. They're really good shooters. <laughs> and the shooter inputs what makes the difference. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, if the, and I have a hard time explaining this to gun companies sometimes. They don't understand. If, you, if you're not a shooter, a lot of the things we're asking you to do, you're just going to, well, get. why are you, why would you want to do that? And when, when you're a shooter, I mean, uh, Bill brought a couple of the guys out from Beretta way back. I did a Beretta-only class here at the ranch uh, almost four years ago, I think it was. And two of the guys were from Beretta. And we were like, you need to do this, you need to do this. By the end of the weekend, they were like, okay, now we, we, now we understand. Now we get it. <laughs> well, listen, from an old gun guy and a getting older gun guy, <laughs> this has been quite an a honor to have Ernest here and tell us a little bit about the Beretta. I appreciate it. Good and my, it's my honor to be. I'm humbled to be here, Ken. You're on, brother. Take care. Mm -hmm.